So my last video about uh, On His Majesty's Secret Service and whether or not Charlie Higson's book was too political kind of plugged me into a conversation people have been having online about James Bond and Ian Fleming and Ian Fleming's politics. A lot of people have him pegged as like left of centre. I think that's really interesting. I wanted to make a video about the politics of Ian Fleming and I'm not interpreting anything. I am not projecting anything. I'm going to use the words of the man himself to explain where he stood politically. And if you are vaguely interested in that, then stay tuned. I think you're going to enjoy this one. Hi guys, it's me. And oh, I'm kind of excited about today's video. So uh, yeah, uh, I made that video about On His Majesty's Secret Service and whether or not it was too political. And it kind of plugged me into a conversation people have been having about James Bond and politics. And it's an interesting one because politics and authors are not necessarily a good mixture and the the political beliefs of an author can often taint their work i had an old girlfriend post a, a, a picture yesterday about how she's looking forward to the new robert galf book or galf galp Thraif. I can't remember, but it's basically the, the pseudonym of J.K. Rowling. She started writing books under a male pseudonym. Uh, and it's interesting because J.K. Rowling is one of those authors whose political viewpoints has, has really damaged her legacy. So she made a lot of pointed comments about trans people and so many people who loved J.K. Rowling, who appreciated the Harry Potter series, who were passionate fans of hers, just completely rejected her and she's like toxic and i know that i wrote an article uh, a few months ago called what can authors learn by studying the writing of jk rowling and people were furious they wrote to the the person who owns the blog and said that i shouldn't write for them anymore and how disgusting it was and i wasn't addressing anything to do with her politics i was addressing you know, things that J.K. Rowling does well as an author and, and what other authors can learn from them. But no, just the mention of her name was like politically, to was just toxic. And I found that really interesting. And it makes you think, you know, when you're looking at your favorite authors whose works you really, really love, do you really want to go down that rabbit hole? Are you ready for what you discover? Because sometimes it, it can be something that really really troubles you another author you can think of is Roald Dahl uh, I love the books of Roald Dahl Roald Dahl has a James Bond connection he wrote the screenplay for you only the twice um, and yet yeah, he said some very distasteful things about Jewish people well I don't know he, he did he did say some very distasteful things about Jewish people and he was kind of mean to some of his Jewish friends but I think he was just a mean crotchety old man. But he also said some very pointed political things about what Israel was doing and what Israel was doing to Palestine and the Lebanon and things. And those those have been lumped in with his anti-Semitic comments. And that's interesting, but it's also made Roald Dahl politically toxic. Um, Stephen King, you know, Stephen King is the greatest American author of my generation. And I have to admit, following him on Twitter. Sometimes I read some of his political posts. I'm just like, all right, okay, boomer. Because uh, he kind of lays it on a bit thick. I don't necessarily have any, any any issue with that. And I still think he's an amazing author. But I'm kind of like, you know what? I really, I don't want to hear it, mate. Um, you've done so many amazing things and you've put across your politics and your beliefs through the fictional worlds you've created. They're a bit tedious when you're just getting at them direct from the fire hose kind of thing. So politics and authors, I don't necessarily think are a good mixture. Um, but I've got good news for you because I've delved quite deep into the politics of Ian Fleming and I managed to do that with this wonderful article I found from The Spectator. It was published on the 9th of October, 1959. And it was called, If I Was Prime Minister by Ian Fleming. And it's like, oh, here we are discussing the politics of Ian Fleming and we have his words uh, right in front of us to be able to actually view what his politics were. And I love that because that means that, that we can actually see firsthand what Ian Fleming believed. And the really good news is, because I know James Bond fans like span a very broad like political view, viewpoint. I would say you have people like uh, 
David Lowbridge Ellis from Licensed to Queer, who, you know, obviously views James Bond through a queer lens. And a, a, a queer lens is not necessarily something you're going to find much support for on people on the further right of the political spectrum who are also drawn to James Bond because of, you know, the, him being a... A, a nationalist hero and uh, and some of the, the things he says about trade unions and he's an upper class British man and um, he likes guns well he doesn't necessarily like guns he uses guns you know there are a lot of things that conservative people uh, find really resonant in the works of James Bond so it's difficult because James Bond really spans this huge gap and when you look into the politics of Ian Fleming the author it's worrying because you're like okay Ian Fleming already had like a, a literary assassination put a, across him uh, years ago when everyone uh, you know saw that this this upstart author was being successful with his lurid books and decided to basically skewer him as as um, a, a a bad writer and they used to do that with Stephen King actually he used to call him a schlockmeister and now he's got a, you know a presidential medal of honor for writing but yeah Ian Fleming got absolutely skewered. Um, from a literary point of view and these days it's very very cool to skewer Ian Fleming and James Bond as like a thing because uh, of you know accusations of misogyny and homophobia and stuff everyone's gone on for years about oh James Bond is sexist and James Bond is racist and James Bond is homophobic and I don't necessarily think those accusations are uh, true or if they are true I don't think they're necessarily that relevant in the context of 2023 considering that those books were written 70 years ago. But the wonderful thing is, when you look at this article from The Spectator and read the words of Ian Fleming himself, whether you're on the left or whether you're on the right, I don't think you're going to be upset. I genuinely don't. Ian Fleming just, you read this article and it filled me with joy because it was flippant and entertaining and amusing and pointed across the fact that he thought politics was absurd but he was very aware of the problems that there were in society but his viewpoint on the solutions to those problems and his viewpoint on what the problems were and where they originated I found quite uplifting uh, because it, clear, it clearly showed that Ian Fleming was actually a very non-judgmental person who saw the best in people so, anyway, um, I will let the man himself explain where he stands politically and maybe maybe comment on that a bit through. And I'm not going to read these out to you. I did something a bit weird. So when I found this article, I originally was trying to research things, so I researched interviews with James Bond, with Ian Fleming, and most of the interviews were about his books. Um, and, you know, back in the, the 50s and 60s, we didn't live in the age of social media, so you didn't have tedious authors like me making content all the time. So there wasn't that much stuff to find. But there was this article in The Spectator, which had everything that, that I think was important about Ian Fleming's politics right there. And I was like, isn't it a pity we didn't have, like, a recording of him reading this article? Well, you know... I, I had this idea of, you know, maybe I'll take those interviews, or those, uh, they were, I wouldn't even say they're hours of interviews, they're like minutes of interviews with Ian Fleming, and lob them into a computer, and get the computer to generate a voice model of Ian Fleming, and then have that voice model read his words. There we go. It's a bit weird, actually. Maybe we'll talk about that after I've done that. But yeah, I'm going to let Ian Fleming himself tell you what his politics were and we're going to start off with a segment that that basically just explains exactly where he stands politically this is the tldr the too long didn't read this is the part you want to hear about so have a listen and see what you think i'm a totally non-political animal i prefer the name of the liberal party to the name of any other and i vote conservative rather than labor mainly because the Conservatives have bigger bottoms and I believe that big bottoms make for better government than scrawny ones. I only once attended a debate in the House of Commons. It was, I think, towards the end of 1938 when we were unattractively trying to cajole Mussolini away from Hitler. I found the hollowness and futility of the speeches degrading and infantile and mendacious platitude verging on the obscene. If this is politics, I reflected, I would much rather not see it happening, and I swore never to re-enter the chamber. 
Okay, wasn't that interesting? I found that interesting because I've always gone on about how Ian Fleming and James Bond, the reason they resonated so much with me is because James Bond as a character and Ian Fleming as a person came from the same socioeconomic background that I did, like upper middle class, uh, the British person, um, Ian Fleming circle and the circle of my parents and my grandparents, they intertwined in certain things. My father was in Jamaica in 1942, at exactly the same period that Ian Fleming was in Jamaica in 1942. Um, my grandfather uh, was involved in intelligence and, uh, and politics to a certain extent. And uh, yeah, my, my grandfather was a member of the Liberal Party, just as Ian Fleming speaks about. He prefers the name of the Liberal Party. But in 1959, when this article was written, that Liberal Party no longer existed. And the champion of that Liberal Party, uh, Winston Churchill, actually moved over to become a Conservative. So back in the 50s, and I think this is why people say that Ian Fleming's politics were kind of left of centre. Back in the 50s, being a Conservative wasn't necessarily the same thing as people think of as being a Conservative today. Like in the days of, of Eisenhower and stuff, being a Republican wasn't the same as being a Republican today. It was actually, I think the Conservative Party had a lot of, of strong, um, purposeful, reasonable beliefs as a political party back in the 50s. And so I think even though he was a Conservative, that doesn't necessarily mean he was a Conservative. Um, but the fact that he just saw straight through the ridiculousness of politics uh, really, I find life affirming because politics is just a disgusting cesspool. Um, it is really the cause of so many of the problems we have in society. It's a grand guignol meant to distract us from the real problems and the real issues and the real seats of power in the world. And I like the fact that Ian Fleming saw straight through that. Um, but when it comes to, to the rest of his politics, what did he think? Well, when it came to the big things, the big issues, this is what he had to say. The big things, the H-bomb, the conquest of outer space, the colour problems, these are too vast and confused for one man's brain. I would leave them to my ministers and to the wave of common sense, which it seems to me, by a process of osmosis between peoples rather than between politicians, is taking a rapid and healthy control of the world. And I love that, don't you? The nice thing about that is um, Ian Fleming acknowledges big problems in the world, the colour problem. I don't quite know what he means by that, but I love the fact that he just says that's that's for other people and smarter people than him. And that was really where I breathed a sigh of relief because I was like, oh, here we go. I don't need to, to discover some um, rancid political belief of Ian Fleming's that is now going to trouble me with his work for the rest of my life. He's he stepped, he wasn't interested in it and he realised he wasn't smart enough to address it. But what I really loved was the fact that he, he spoke about this wave of common sense and how it's uh, people, not politicians, who are really driving the solutions to these problems. That was a wonderfully optimistic way to view humanity and society and the world. And I think it's very different to how we view society these days. A lot of us are always complaining that society is getting dumber. I don't necessarily think that's true. I was thinking my own experiences of you know being bullied as a teenager and now that level of bullying just doesn't seem to exist in schools to the same degree because I think society has through a process of osmosis become more empathetic and I think part of it is social media and giving everyone the opportunity to have their voice diverse voices that means people are more willing to overlook the things that make people different and and see them the things that make them the same and that positivity that Ian Fleming had and that uh, that viewpoint of common sense and common man, I think is is really wonderful. And that's one of the things I loved about this article. One of the things that I will now love about Ian Fleming as an author. There was something else that he wrote that that really continues that. And so listen to this bit and, and see what you think about the biggest problem that, that he thinks is addressing the people of, of Great Britain and what he would do about it if he was prime minister. I would try and stop people being ashamed of themselves. In the United Kingdom, we have a basically non-conformist conscience, and the fact that taxation, controls, and certain features of the welfare state have turned the majority of us into petty criminals, liars, and work dodgers is, I'm sure, having a very bad effect on the psyche of the kingdom. Agosh, 
Doesn't that resonate with you? I think, I think that's that's one of the things that we've missed in, in, in society at the moment. It seems like the left and the right are just so intent on controlling us, and not just controlling us, but controlling how we think. I mean, you have this whole like group think problem. I mentioned J.K. Rowling. Yeah, I wrote an, a non-political article about J.K. Rowling, and people called for me to lose lose my column on that particular blog because of it because it's all become so ideological and the government whichever government you're talking about the british government or the american government they put so many rules up there that almost end up turning good honest law-abiding people into criminals gun laws in america is a very good one you know the moment in california and other places they're they're making all these laws about oh um we're going to redefine what a receiver in a gun is and by doing that, they will automatically turn 10,000 American gun owners who are peaceful and law-abiding citizens into felons. And it's like, if you're passing laws that make peaceful people become criminals, uh, then there is something very wrong with that. And I like the what Ian Fleming wrote about how you need to have society that is less ashamed of itself, uh, need to have a society that you know, doesn't get told what to do all the time. Have this basic assumption that human beings are capable of being rational, sensible, kind, decent people and give them the freedom to demonstrate that. Yes, there are always going to be bad apples, but for the most part, human beings are good people. And whether you're atheist or Muslim or Christian, I truly believe every human being at their core knows the difference between right or wrong. And really, it's it's religions and governments and ideologies that brainwash and gaslight people into doing what's wrong, thinking it's right. If you just leave people alone, normally, I truly believe they'll do the right thing. But yeah, that's, that's me. Um, I found another segment in this later on that was really, really interesting. That's what... It, one of the things that, that I think people trip up on uh, politically these days is the idea of like welfare and the welfare state. And, you know, I think as a society, you absolutely benefit from having a safety net for people who fall on hard times or aren't capable of looking after themselves. You want to have a safety net uh, so, you know, that you, you don't just cast them out into the gutter. But at the same time, it is quite a dangerous situation to have a safety net that becomes more of a, a gilded cage. And I, ex you know, I, I experienced that. My brother, who was much smarter and more capable and better educated than me, kind of like fell through the cracks in life and ended up living on welfare in the UK for a little while. And when he got his shit together and wanted to leave, it was almost impossible. Because the moment you started, you know, actually earning money for yourself, you got so much of your welfare taken away that you were therefore unable to look after yourself. And it's kind of becomes a trap. And um, mentioning anything to do with welfare these days is kind of a tricky thing. It was that, that musician, what's his name? Uh, Oliver something, who sung that song, Rich Men, Northern Richmond. And so many people loved the bits, that, that half of it about how terrible politicians were. And then so many people on the left wing got really, really upset because he mentioned people on welfare being 300 pounds. And it's kind of like, yeah, you've, when you talk about welfare, normally uh, it's a really politically charged thing. And Jane, Ian Fleming does talk about welfare. But the wonderful thing is he doesn't talk about it in any other way that's going to offend people. He specifically talks about the, the welfare artist. And what he means by that is, and this is much more common back in the 50s and 60s, artists who are funded by the government to create art. And he wasn't necessarily a big fan of that. He wasn't much of a fan of the state-funded arts. And I think his solution to it makes a lot of sense, actually. Having observed at close quarters the great waste of money on paint and canvases in one of our schools, I'm not convinced that the welfare artist is worth encouraging any farther. Instead, therefore, of spending larger sums on the arts, I would spend them on the crafts. I would encourage the fine metal workers, uh, mellers, binders, printers, woodworkers, etc., in a most lavish fashion and attempt to arrest at once the decline of the craftsman, even down to the lowly thatcher. And I, I like that. I think one of the problems that we have in society at the moment is we are encouraging uh, kids all the time to go to university and to get a degree, which is fine, but 
there are many other things that you can do in life and uh, and earn a very good living, often a better living than you could with a university degree, that don't involve going to university. I mean, if you're a self-employed plumber or carpenter or electrician in New Jersey, you're bringing home really, really good money. If you get become a factory worker uh, as part of a union, you're probably bringing home more money than half the people who work in an office cubicle with a degree. So um, I really like that. I think it is a really good idea to, to basically say, hey, do yeah, what skills you have could be used constructively in a way that will give you the same artistic and creative output as, as you need, but also, you know, be a value to society and be lucrative for you as a person. So there we go. I don't know. I quite enjoyed that. Um, and where he moves on next, I really, really enjoy because, you know, being British, you have a certain pride in Britain. I mean, Britain is always going through things that uh, are problematic and, and people get upset about or people support. You know, Brexit was a very interesting time to, to be British with people asking your opinions and things. But at the end of the day, I'm even though I live in America and I'm an American citizen, I'm still proud to be British. And I think Britain stands for something. I would say, you know, British values are uh, dignity and integrity and honour um, and pride in what you do. You know, Henry V's wonderful speech about uh, once more into the breach, dear friends, or he talks about your strong limbs, limbs that were built in England. Yeah, being being British is it's something that, that you shouldn't be ashamed of. Uh, and being British, your British values are different from the activities of the British government, for example. And let's look into that because Ian Fleming has this wonderful segment about what all of these creative artists who he thinks should be pushed into the crafts should do and I kind of like it. So listen to this and tell me what you think. To give the craftsman, the designer and of course the artist an outlet for his capabilities. I would take the Rolls-Royce motor car as an example and persuade all manufacturers that, let us say, 5% of output should consist of an absolutely top grade luxury product in which price is entirely secondary consideration. Every firm would then be producing, perhaps only in small quantities, the Rolls-Royce of its particular line of manufacture, real grain whiskey and gin, quintessentially distilled ice cream made with real strawberries and real cream, lavatory paper as luxurious as a peach skin, scissors that actually cut your nails, and so on through the list of all our products. By this means, I would make quality goods available to those here and abroad who like these things and can afford them, and I would hope to educate the masses to eschew the shoddy. Coincidentally, in the world's markets, British maids would go back to the place where it used to belong. There we go. I kind of like that. It, it, it shows, to a certain extent, his out-of-touchness with um, things, because Ian Fleming was from an affluent, uh, upper-class background. One thing that he never had to struggle with throughout his life was money, which is an interesting situation for an artist to, to come from. Um, so maybe to a certain extent he doesn't quite get it, but at the same time, yeah, pride in Britain, pride in great craftsmanship. Making made in Britain mean something again. I like that. It appeals to that that stupid pint-drinking Englishman deep down in my heart that still exists no matter how long I've lived in America. Right, this next segment I really love. It is wild. Okay, listen to this. I would consult with my Minister of Leisure about the possibility of turning the Isle of Wight into one vast pleasure dome. Here there would be casinos and the most luxurious masons of tolerance in the world. This would be a world where the frustrated citizen of every class could give full rein to those basic instincts for sex and gambling which have been crushed through the ages. At last our Cliffgate libido would have an outlet and the sleazy striptease joints, romp sprung street walkers and backroom card games would be out of business forever. Yeah, imagine that. Can you imagine the Isle of Wight as basically like the Las Vegas of, of Great Britain? I'm not opposed to that. I mean, my granddad used to live in the Isle of Wight. Uh, but I, once again, I think what this shows is Ian Fleming understood that people had vices and needed outlets. And we lived in a society that tried to control them and have rules and regulations and morality was oppressive in those days. And 
he saw that you needed to give people a healthy outlet to these things. This is why I don't think Ian Fleming was homophobic. I know, you know, he made a few colourful comments about uh, gay people in his books and uh, and so forth, but his books are rife with, with homoeroticism. He was friends with a number of, of, like, gay people, even openly gay people in those times. I think he just saw that human beings were human. And if you stop trying to control them, then, uh, and gave them an outlet for the things that they needed an outlet for, then, you know, the best in them would, would bubble to the surface. And that's what I think, this faith in, in like, inherent goodness and competence of the human being and of society as a whole is really refreshing, and I like it. Um, this next segment blew me away. So, out of all the people in the world as literary figures, who do you think would be most supportive of like fossil fuels and, and the car and cars and and stuff. Ian Fleming loved his Bentley. He loved cars. He loved fast cars and stuff. And would you believe though he was a massive advocate? And remember, this is 1959. A massive advocate for electric vehicles. There we go. Listen to this and tell me what you think. Our present internal combustion engine is a ridiculous steam age contraption which turns only a modest proportion of fuel into energy and spews the rest out in the form of petrol vapour of a more or less solid consistency. When there is no wind, this lies in a dense layer in our streets and we breathe it in day and night. It then rises into the upper atmosphere where I am told it forms a kind of envelope round the world which has the effect of interfering with the beneficial rays of the sun. Whether that is so or not, the petrol engine is obviously a noxious and noisy machine, and I would gradually abolish and replace it by some form of electric motor. This would take some time, but I would hope that within three years of assuming office, I could have converted the whole of central London to electric transport. Isn't that amazing? So there we go. Ian Fleming was a massive advocate for electric vehicles. I think that's huge news. Uh, I think that's delightful. I love it. Yeah, I always think of Ian Fleming and, and his big Bentley and stuff. And I, I imagine he'd be like Jeremy Clarkson. It's like, yeah, I'll, I'll never drive an electric vehicle. I didn't even think people were having conversations about electric vehicles. But now you think about it, back in 1959, yeah, we all had these little electric milk carts that used to come around our neighbourhoods delivering milk. And, you know, in the 1959... People did think of other forms of, of transportation. My grandfather, my father's father, had a steam-powered car before the war. So, yeah, I find that really interesting. So there we go. Ian Fleming, massive, massive advocate for the electric vehicle because of the, the impact it had on the environment and smog and stuff like that. Bet you didn't see that one coming. Right. And finally, there's, there's just him summing things up. Uh, and I kind of I find a couple of sections of this really interesting. So listen to this. There are other various small matters I would attend to, such as men's clothing, which I regard as out of date, unhygienic and rather ridiculous. Breast reform, we have the grimmiest press in the world. The matter of titles, I would greatly reinforce the orders of chivalry. And if a lord or a baron or an earl did not behave as a lord or a baron or an earl should, he would lose his title after the third offence, as is more or less the case with service rank. Great state prizes for all inventions or innovations that were even of remote benefit to the Commonwealth. Enthusiastic encouragement of emigration, but more particularly of a constant flow of peoples within the Commonwealth. A Commonwealth super parliament and less fried food for the constipated masses. What I found really interesting there, there were two, two things. First of all, the state of journalism she calls the, the grimiest uh, the grimiest press in the world the state of journalism these days is disgusting like it is revolting in america the mainstream journalism and in britain to be honest the mainstream journalism they're just mouthpieces of the government and the government is actively doing things to crush out dissenting voices and yeah it, it is something that needs to be reformed but it needs to be reformed not by the folks in congress it needs to be reformed by actual citizens of the country because we want to have a free and honest press so the fact that ian fleming could identify that as a journalist as an editor of a newspaper way back in 1959 i think is significant 
And the next thing is uh, that I found was really interesting was his belief in the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth, of course, were all of the, the countries that had used to be British colonies and part of the British Empire, you know, as, as they became independent countries, a lot of them still had the Queen as, as the head of state. They still had very, very British forms of rule and British forms of government, and they formed the Commonwealth, which was this, which still is, you know, this wonderful amalgam of countries that aren't brought together necessarily by geography, but more by this, these common values as that were instilled by the British Empire. And I think a lot of people are against colonialism and, and talk about the negative aspects of colonialism. And I think you have to acknowledge that those exist. But at the same time, as somebody who who has been, you know, his, his fa entire family is rooted in colonialism. You know, my grandparents were born in India. My parents, my father was raised in Jamaica. My parents were married in um, uh, Africa, in Kenya. Uh, I was married in the Bahamas, you know, be former and actual British colonies are like something that my family is, is deeply, intimately familiar with. And I've noticed when I went to India, people were interested in me and respected the fact that I was British and spoke about things that were the legacy of the British rule that were positive. And there were definitely very, very negative things. Some of the things the British did in the colonies were just disgusting. And, you know, we are the bad guys in so many situations. But at the same time, we have been very fortunate in having this sort of rose tinted viewpoint of us. And I think Ian Fleming saw that and saw the benefit of the Commonwealth and the shared values that the Commonwealth had. And I like the fact that there was the enthusiastic encouragement of emigration. It's not immigration. That's emigration, as in British people going abroad to live in Commonwealth countries. It's kind of like reverse immigration. I know a lot of people are talking about immigration now as an issue. And I love the fact that Ian Fleming really wasn't. He didn't even acknowledge that as, as a problem or a concern. But he was very keen at like British people should go and live in other countries. But he did talk about uh, more particularly of a constant flow of peoples within the Commonwealth, which I found quite interesting. That was something that happened quite quite naturally anyway. Um, for example, when my parents lived in Africa, the middle class was largely Indian because the British co British had gone to India and they had, the Indian economy had definitely been transformed by that. And then you had very entrepreneurial Indians who went to other British colonies and created a very strong middle class. And that is something that's consistent throughout America. I mean, right here where I live in New Jersey, they call it Little Mumbai because everyone around here is Indian. but it also means that everyone around here has, uh, you know, it, I don't know, for me, it's it's amazingly familiar because living around English people, uh, Indian people is very much like living around British people. Um, and it means we have, we live in a really nice neighborhood, wonderful Indian food, but also wonderful infrastructure, wonderful facilities. You can leave your, your front door unlocked. It's, um, it's interesting. There is definitely a positive aspect to people from different places moving to new places and bringing the positive parts of their, their community and their values there. So I love this idea of the constant flow of people throughout the Commonwealth because, and that obviously would mean people from the Commonwealth coming to England. I like that. I think largely Ian Fleming was a fan of immigration and diversity just from that statement alone. Um, I also like the idea of a Commonwealth super parliament which uh, is an interesting idea. I mean, we had the European Union, I think that was slightly before, before Ian Fleming's time. Uh, you've got the United States, you've got NATO, you've got the United Nations, you've got all of these big groups together. Uh, a super parliament for the Commonwealth and being able to, to unite the Commonwealth. Imagine just the, the, the sheer scale and economic impact the Commonwealth has on the world. Unite that the super parliament and that becomes a, a, another superpower basically like you're it's i don't know it's amazing it's uh i don't understand enough about it to have much much of a, a nuanced viewpoint but i can understand why i'd be interested with that anyway oh less fried food for the constipated masses well that's probably true so those are the politics of ian fleming i know this is quite a long video actually but I found it really, really interesting to delve into them. I found it a really positive thing as well. I came out of that feeling really good about Ian Fleming. He came across to me 
as a delightfully flippant person, very, very clever. Some of the wordplay he uses is, is amazing, but at the, the heart of it, he had, I believe, a great faith in the common sense and the goodness of human beings. And I think he was ideologically against anybody on the left or the right or religion or whatever, trying to control people and trying to tell people what to do and trying to pass moral judgment on them. I am absolutely convinced that if Ian Fleming was alive today, he would probably say something quite innocuous that people would use against him and try and cancel him. But I truly believe out of all of the authors I've looked into the politics of, and I recently just went down a rabbit hole of looking into the politics of Anthony Burgess, of all people. But of all the authors I look into the politics of, I think Ian Fleming, I, I come out feeling the best about. Because I truly think that he was a terrible politician, but he was, as in he wasn't a politician, but he would have been a terrible politician, but he was a, a really good human being. I really truly believe that. And I think the friends that he made throughout his life. I mean, he dealt with difficult things and he had a traumatic life and a traumatic upbringing and his relationship with his mother was weird. And I know necessarily, he wasn't necessarily like the most politically correct of people. And it was all, a, I don't know, you could look at uh, what happened with his son and go down a rabbit hole like that. But from reading that article, I think essentially Ian Fleming was a very good person who saw the best in people and just had a faith that if you gave people leeway to do the right thing they would and that's what i take away from it and if you disagree i would love to hear about it in the comments section down below um but uh, until then yeah i'll be back with another video soon thanks very much for watching i'm roland Hume. i've sold 67,000 copies of my books if you want to find out how i did it i've got the link right here you can click and otherwise don't forget to subscribe i've got more videos coming soon thank you